Uh, thank you all for coming. Let's, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with our lesson. So, dear God, just thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for uh, the warmth that it gives, a reminder of the, the light that we have from you, Lord, both through your truth and your presence, uh, reflective of your glory. And as we've seen, uh, looking at the concept of joy, help us to remember that uh, our ultimate joy is found in you and seeing your glory and reflecting that and then also experiencing that in a, a unique and intimate way. And so, Lord, just be with us today as we look at the concept of the selfish heart and how that can be a, a barrier to our experiencing joy in you and what we can be doing to uh, eliminate that. We just ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so if you've been with us through the series, we've been looking at barriers to seeing Christ, uh, barriers to experiencing joy in Christ. We've looked at a blind heart, a thirsty heart, uh, a hurting heart, a troubled heart, a judgmental heart. And this last week, we're looking at the concept of a selfish heart. And so <clears throat> uh, last week, I talked about in the context of sort of this chair analogy again that uh, our our, our body or our flesh, as Paul talks about it in the context of the uh, sin nature that we have, has both sort of a, a judgmental component. We looked at that last week and then also has sort of a selfish component. Uh, sometimes we act like children. Do you have to teach children how to be selfish? No, they just kind of pick that up somehow, right? So... It's kind of embedded in us. I want to open with a, a little video clip uh, from a, a book that I, I suspect a lot of you have, have, have seen, have read to your children or uh, your grandchildren. Uh, it's called The Giving Tree. Has anyone heard of that before? Okay, so I found a video clip uh, of this book that tries to uh, actually put it in, in a... Uh, contact with real actors. And I thought it kind of gave a different perspective than reading the, the book, so I thought I'd play that today. And again, we want to think about what does this have to say about the nature of selfishness or selflessness, uh, and how does it impact the people involved? So hopefully this will work. Once there was a tree that she loved a little boy, and every day the boy would go and he would gather her leaves and make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat apples and they would play hide and seek. <laughs> and when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade. And the boys loved the tree very much. And the tree was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older. tree was often left alone. Then one day the boy came to the tree and the tree said, Come boy, come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. Too big to climb and play. I want to buy stuff and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry. But I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money, and you will be happy. 
And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And the tree was sad. And then one day, the boy came back. Come, boy. Climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I'm too busy to climb trees. I want a house to keep me warm. too old and sad to play. I want a boat to take me far away from here. Cut down my trunk and make a boat. Then you can sail away and be happy. So, um, <clears throat> what's your reaction when you watch that video? The tree gave everything he had. The tree gave everything he had? Okay, or she had? Okay. Like mom? Like mom? Okay. 
what else what else can you can you observe from the video the boy kept taking okay okay from giving who was the happy person in the video the boy or the tree the tree would you say the boy was unhappy He was always pursuing joy, and it's like he never found it uh, away from the tree. Okay. He just wanted. He just wanted. Okay. Society. More and more. More and more. Okay. I any other analogies you can think of or metaphors? Is it different seeing it with real actors than reading the book? Gives a different perspective a little bit, doesn't it? Okay. Right. What can you do for me? Mm-hmm. Okay. At first, they had a relationship. Okay. Okay. How much um, how much can the tree represent God and the boy represent us? And we take and we take. Uh huh. It's a place of rest. Okay. But instead of wanting to that relationship with with God, we keep running off pursuing other things to try to get our joy. To try to make us happy. To try to make us happy. Okay. Have you ever thought of the tree in the context of God and the boy as, as us? <coughs> Another perspective on that story, isn't it? Okay. So we're looking at this concept of selfishness and how the selfish heart can be a barrier to our joy. Would, would you characterize the boy as selfish? I think that would be probably an accurate description. There may be some other attributes there, but certainly uh, that was the case. To, to what degree do you think his selfishness was a barrier to his joy here? Okay, yeah, it's like we talked about uh, several lessons ago about instead of being a conduit for God's glory and reflecting that, he was trying to use things to take to fill that, that hole, so to speak, right? So, um, so let's think about that from a, a scriptural perspective. Uh, here's a quote from Philip Yancey that specifically talking about Christians, but I think it's a very poignant uh, concept that I, that's in your notes. He says, uh, there remains within each Christian heart, no matter how righteous or sanctified, an ever-present and smoldering cinder of evil from which the flicker of sinful desire will occasionally leap forth to allure and spur the heart to sin. Like the ever-vigilant eye upon a campfire in a dry forest, we must always be on guard for the sin that so easily besets us. For while over time and by, by God's grace we may conquer those external and gross sins, we may be surprised to find that they are in fact often replaced with a more hideous, uh, hidden and hideous, uh, insidious form, a form that may not be overtly obvious to those around us, yet they remain and track us still throughout our lives like a phantom stalker at times out of sight or even dormant like a sleeping, sleeping virus, yet always there. Discontent, pride, and greed are internal sins that grow like mold in the do dark, moist corners of the human psyche, nourished by slight rejections, mild paranoia, and loneliness. The precise occupational pattern are hazards of many who pursue a career in ministry, which is an interesting perspective. I find those silent specters hovering around every word that I write. This is Nancy now talking. Even when I write out of a heart of humility and compassion, I suspect that pride is always there lurking, waiting for a chance to feel good about what I've written or taken credit for, or well-crafted or even cleverly spun, waiting desperately for thumbs and hearts to suddenly appear. What do you think about that quote? 
you think that's that's an accurate portrayal of us sometimes? <laughs> okay. Yes. In what way is that frightening and accurate, do you think? It's always there. Yeah? We don't even have to chase it. No. Not not on this side of heaven, right? Yeah, the letter I, right? Okay. Why do you think? Uh, why do you think that that's the case? We're gonna look at that. Um, think about the Bible. What, what are some examples of selfish or prideful people in the Bible? Can you think of some? David and Bathsheba. Okay, that's a good example. Jonah. Jonah. Yeah, he was uh, sort of a classic narcissist, I think. Yeah, but Saul. Saul, okay. Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. Yeah, Jacob, the grabber. That's his name, right? Constantly trying to grab everything. So, some other examples you can think of. Satan, Satan obviously, he's kind of the the epitome of of, of selfishness, right? Any other examples? Who? Cain. Cain? Yeah, Cain. Abs- yep, Cain, exactly. Uh, Eve, even, probably. So here, here's a few lists uh, of, of people that are identified as kind of selfish in the Bible. Uh, remember Achan? Uh, how about Ahab? Remember King Ahab and Jezebel? He was what he had everything, but he wanted that one little uh, garden over there, right? The plot. So there's lots of uh, individuals in in the Bible that uh, uh, had this issue of selfishness. Is there anything that kind of is common to all those individuals, other than just they're selfish? They had it, and they still wanted more. That's yeah. They did all. Most of them have it, didn't they? And they still wanted it. Okay. Is that fascinating? Uh, and we'll talk about how, how selfishness b- can become uh, a slavery or an enslavement. Okay. Uh, so why are we selfish? I think we get some insight in James, uh, James chapter four. He kind of lays out sort of the treatise talking about selfishness. I think he identifies at least five factors in that passage. It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not your passions that are war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so that you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. <clears throat> you, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enemy with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, or do you suppose it is n- no purpose that the Scripture writes? He yearns jealously over the Spirit that he may <clears throat> that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So there's at least I think five five things we can look at. One of the reasons we're selfish is is we're born with what <clears throat> we have a sin nature. We have this inclination. Okay, it's like Enoch was saying, it's something that's in us. It's always there. It's kind of, it's kind of tracking us, uh, like the, uh, the short essay by Yancey. Um, so how does our sin nature incline us to be selfish? Or how does our sin nature cause us to be selfish? What? It makes us very self-centered, self-serving. self-serving. Uh, you think of Satan, like we mentioned. I mean, he, he wanted the, everything to be his focus. And, and fascinating, E was the same way. It's just, you know, right out, right out of the chute, so to speak. Okay, we all, he came, all of us. Okay. Uh, okay. Or we have rights. Okay. 
Th that's right. So, so really, we, 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 it's an issue of a lack of faith, too, isn't it? We don't, we don't trust God. We, we say, well, I've got to take matters into my own hands and take care of myself because uh, I, I don't trust God. Uh, I mean, we, we, we don't ask God in faith. A lot of times we don't ask God because we know that what we're asking for is probably not in his will, right? So that's why we don't ask him. Uh, so we come up with other ways to take care of ourselves, and we kind of ask God to bless what we decide to do. Uh, so that's the second reason, because of our lack of faith. Uh, James says, just pretty explicitly, you, you adulterous people, uh, so we're idolaters. What does that mean, and how does that relate to selfishness, do you think? What is an idolater? Somebody's worshiping idols? Or anything in place of God? So what is the, what is the thing we all tend to kind of worship? Money. Money, but ourselves, right? Okay. Do you think we, we tend to worship ourselves? Even if it's not worship, it's focus. Because even, I read something once that said, um, even say, um, kind of the same things about God, but you still like, I'm, I'm the worst, I'm, I'm bad, or I'm stupid, is still focused on self and not on God, so it's still idolatrous. It's not, it's false humility. Well, it's not, it's sometimes it's, it's a way to solicit praise. Oh, you're not that way. You're don't be. Don't, you're really good. You know that's ridiculous. You know you look wonderful or something like that, right? But it's not just thinking that you're awesome. It's also the focus on what you're doing is wrong by yourself. Is is still focused on yourself. Right. Uh, do you remember that? I think it was last week. I gave that essay by Pascal about the self that we're always looking to kind of worried about our image and everything. Uh, if everybody read that, that's really good. Um, very convicting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating sometimes to look at people's face, Facebook pages. Okay. Right. Yeah, we, we do tend to do that. We, we kind of put ourselves at the, on the pedestal. Unless, unless you're a mother, like the, that tree, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, we, mothers tend to kind of maybe don't take care of themselves sometimes, uh, I think. Um, uh, another reason, he says, is because we love the world. You think about over in uh, 1 John. John talks about the characteristics of loving the world, these three characteristics. We looked at those also a couple of weeks ago, so the less the flesh, the less the eyes. The pride of life, we're looking at things to try to make us happy, and we, we're constantly focused on bringing those in. And then finally, uh, another reason is because it goes back to that pride issue. I'm pride, I, I'm proudful, but pride is something you have to keep feeding. Do you notice that? It's you always have to keep feeding that to me. It's like it always is, it's like. Uh, Jeremiah talks about it. It's like a broken cistern. It, it never holds the water. It always keeps draining out. So you always have to be doing things to keep protecting your, your image or further building your image. Uh, it's it's an endless pursuit. Okay, so what 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 is kind of the progression of selfishness? I want to Think about the fact that selfishness is not only insidious, but it, it, if it's sort of like a cancer. It's like Yancey talks about. It keeps growing. Have you noticed people that just selfishness doesn't tend to just die off? It just kind of gets worse, unless obviously the Holy Spirit that Christ intervenes in that situation. Can you think on the national scene, you can just look at, our media is just dominated by selfish people, and, and it's like they just keep getting worse. Uh, so it's, fun, it's uh, looking at an example. Uh, remember what happened with Lot and Abraham when they, their, their two uh, sort of groups were starting to have a conflict, so they said, this isn't going to work out. We're going to have to split up. And so Abraham, the, the older 
more senior person offers Lot the option of what land he takes and what is land what land does Lot take? What he thinks is the best, right? It's explicitly in scripture about that. Uh, did his choice work out so good? Not not so well, right? Um, so there's there's an example of selfishness. Uh, so f- Larry Crabb uh, wrote several books that I, I really enjoy. One of them was a book on relationships between men and women. Uh, and he talks about one of the problems in relationships is not selfishness, but what he calls justified selfishness or justified self-centeredness. Um, and so I think we can see an example of that in the, the life of Jonah. Not only was he selfish, but he justified his selfishness. And in this case, he actually was justifying his selfishness with God. Remember what happens? God relents from destroying Nineveh. Jonah gets mad. Why does Jonah get mad about it? Okay, that's, that's certainly one part of the issue. What's another part of the issue? Yeah, it made him look bad, right? It's like, you know, I told you, I told these guys you were going to wipe them out, and now you don't. It makes me look bad. Okay, that was his focus. So he was very selfish. And then he justifies that selfishness by essentially blames God because, well, I knew this was what you would do because you have this character, you know, so you, you should just let, you know, that's why I left in the first place. So you see how Jonah is justifying his selfishness here? Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, and following up on that concept, Larry, Larry Crabb writes, careful inspection of ourselves, particularly when we're angry, and this is in the context of relationships mainly, uh, it is clear that we suffer from a defect more severe than mere self-centeredness. The greatest obstacle to right relationship with God and truly, rela- truly good relationships with others is justified self-centeredness. A selfishness deep in our soul feels entirely reasonable and therefore acceptable in light of how we've been treated. What do you think, uh, what do you think Crab's talking about there? How is, how is justified self-centeredness different from s- selfishness? Sometimes we can be selfish and be unaware of it. Okay, we're still selfish people and be unaware of it. What's the implication of justified self-centeredness? You're like, you're consciously choosing it and you're aware of it and then you're going all these extremes to actually justify it on top of it. You feel entitled. Exactly, it goes back to that concept of entitled, right? Do, do you ever find yourselves maybe doing that? We always can come up with a reason why it's not our fault, right? It's that other person's fault. This is especially true in relationships, right? It's that, if that rotten husband, if I didn't have to deal with him, I wouldn't be so selfish. It's just, you know, if he would do a better job of taking care of me or whatever. So flip, flip the relationship. But, uh, do you see why that can be so insidious? Because not only, <clears throat> it's like you've gone right past the stop sign. It's like God is talking about selfishness, and you've just driven right past it, and now you're justifying why you just went by the stop sign. Okay? But, uh, in that person's mind, they're not being selfish. That's just the way it is. Well, that's, but that's, the, that's the ultimate result of justification, right? We do that with all of our sins, ultimately, don't we? Right, and that that's, that shows sort of the one of the insidious natures of selfishness. It, it it progresses to it starts blinding you and enslaving you, doesn't it? Right. Yes, okay, I, I will turn the cheek once, but after that I can do whatever I want to, right? 
That's right. I've waited here. I've waited several years. So it's like I think it's uh, it's time for me to take over. Right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. We're all guilty of that, aren't we? OK. Uh, there's another quote he talks about that I really like uh, talking about, again, um, apologies. This has been very convicting for me. He says, we must realize that explanations of sin are not requests for forgiveness, but for understanding. When we regard our wrong actions as understandable, we feel only a little guilty, but meaningful repentance and enduring change require more than cause a casual confessions of uh, guilt. And they also require more than strongly announcing our selfishness and firmly exhorting others to selflessness. Movement from self-centeredness towards other-centeredness only happens when we expose our excuses for selfishness, regard those excuses as entirely illegitimate. Thus, true apologies never explain. They only admit acknowledging that the error was without justifiable cause. So think about times when you've apologized for something. Did you ever add an explanation? <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, that's, I'm sorry if I offended you. It's your problem. You know, it's not my problem. It's your problem. So, yes. Okay. Uh. <laughs> so what do you think about that? Do we do that? Do we like to I- explain away our, our, our selfishness? Well, that's true. You you you're, you say, why in the world would you do this? I, I need to understand this, right? Yeah. Well, if the person said, I mean, I I think there's a difference between maybe an explanation and a justification, right? So if I, I if I say to you, I'm sorry, I hit you, uh, I have no excuse for that. You know, I just have sin in my life I'm trying to deal with. So, and all I can do is ask you to forgive me. So, as opposed to, well, you know, I just had a rough day. My alarm didn't go off. I'm rushing around, and you know, we we, we just want we want to tr- somehow minimize that. It gets back to self again, right? Because to apologize to someone else is uh, truly apologizing is admitting that you have deficiencies in yourself, and we don't want to do that, okay? We, want to, we don't want to be exposed that way. Um, okay, so then, you know, selfishness can progress, and I see this a lot in our culture, to sort of a more sinister form of narcissism. Does everybody know what, what that mean word, that narcissism is? How would you describe a narcissist? Just absolutely consume with self, right? You think there's a few narcissists in Washington, D.C.? Maybe many, yes. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, narcissism is just sort of this, it just, it just, it just consumes everything. Uh, I think Timothy kind of, or, or Paul and Timothy captures this, talking about uh, in the last days, there will come difficult with people will be lovers of self, and then he goes through all these subsequent implications or consequences of that, uh, which a lot, I think, we can kind of see in our culture today, tragically, can't we? Uh, so wh- one, of the, one of the concerns about selfishness is that it can progress, can go from selfishness to justified self-centeredness to the point where you don't even think about necessarily what people are doing. You're just totally consumed with self. Everything is about you. Uh, and you're not even trying to hide it anymore. Okay. Uh, so it is fascinating that Paul talks to Timothy. What's his admonition with dealing with people like this? 
It says avoid them. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had an encounter or had to put up or deal with a narcissist. Well, what, what you'll find is you, you, they're just, only God can, can get through that. You're not going to be able to, to talk or rationalize or, or communicate with people like that. At some point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes as Christians even, we need to kind of separate from people and you just have to have boundaries. You know, I think as, as being Christians doesn't mean that we need to put ourselves in relationships with narcissists. I mean, we can be loving, we can pray for people, but, but we have to have boundaries and allow God to work in that person's life. Sometimes by us continuing to engage with them, we're inhibiting, I think, God from, from really working with them. Yes? Right. So you enable people's sin through a merciful attitude. Right. It's not really merciful because the merciful thing to do is to show them their sin. Right. So how, you know, so I've learned to protect myself a little bit from that, but then there's that struggle between at what point is that a selfish attitude in my own heart of I can't, you know, like sometimes I look at people and I'm like, nope, not today. Not can't do that today. Right. Sure. The appropriate, you know, not... No, no, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, that's something we have to deal with. The fact that you struggle with that question, I think, w would indicate to me that you're already sensitive to that. Uh, and I, I, I think there are individuals just like uh, that have the characteristics that you've expressed that people will take advantage of. And I don't, I don't think Christ wants us to be taken advantage of. Ultimately, the question is, how, how is that relationship affecting my relationship with Christ? Okay, so if that relationship, I think, is pulling, away, pulling you away from Christ, so that, that, that the, the, like, the abuse that you may be experiencing is is really affecting that relationship then i think that's important probably to pull away till either that person changes or that you can develop the spiritual capability to to handle that so uh, i think the fact that you're asking yourself am i being selfish shows that you've got sort of a heart that's sensitive to what the Lord is saying, but I, I don't think that means that you need to put yourselves into abusive relationships, right? And I mean, there are a lot of narcissists out there in our culture. Um, and my point is, sometimes I think the spiritual thing to do is to have boundaries and try to work around that. Does that help any? It does. I think sometimes I just need someone to affirm to me that boundaries are appropriate. Yes, I think certainly boundaries are appropriate. Okay. Otherwise, you end up like a skunk, like the tree. Right. None of us really aspire to be a skunk. <laughs> but yet, you look at the tree and you think, that is so average, and I don't want to be that. So you. Right. No. Well, but but just look at Jesus' life. Yeah. Okay. He. He reached out and ministered to all kinds of people, but he also had boundaries. He also had some very scathing things to say about people that were narcissist. Okay, so I think we can kind of use that also as a model. I think, I think w we tend to have this thing beat into us, don't be selfish, don't be selfish, don't be selfish, and sometimes we, we, we interpret that to the perspective that, uh, well, I can't ever do anything. I, again, it, gets go, it goes back to what is our purpose. Our purpose is to see God's glory reflected and experience that. And there are relationships that are going to inhibit that. And so I think when, when, there, when you have a choice uh, that you, you need to possibly pull away from those situations, uh, be ready to be engaged and be watchful for the Holy Spirit to work. But, but I think for your own spiritual and your own emotional and mental health, sometimes you need to have boundaries. Okay, so.
or I can handle this. Yes, okay. Or sometimes I will be the more, I, sometimes we can, we can take pride in our martyrdom. Do you know what I mean by that? Okay, so I, I, that, that also can become sort of pride through the back door, ironically, sometimes, right? Um, okay, so, so why is selfishness so dangerous? Uh, it can enslave us. Can selfishness enslave you? You ever seen a child that is selfish that the parents just keep enabling that behavior? Does that free them? No, it does not free them, does it? Okay. Uh, so it can enslave us. It leads to conflict. This is coming then again out of our passage uh, that we just looked at. Uh, it leads to conflict when we have selfishness, when we want just what we want. There is conflict. It's just fascinating to watch like preschoolers or whatever fighting over a toy or some kid can have all these other toys. And this one kid goes and picks up this other toy and the kid runs and fights. Anybody ever observe that behavior? I'm glad as adults we never grow out of we grow out of that, right? So, uh, selfishness can make you foolish. Um, the writer of the Proverbs, Solomon says, "Whoever isolates himself seeks his, and seeks his own desire, he breaks out against all sound judgment." Can selfishness make us foolish or do foolish things? Ever uh, get? upset about some situation that ultimately is reflecting on yourself and you're going to set the you're going to set the situation straight and so you write out this brilliant email and send it to all these people anybody ever do that boy it sure feels good writing it doesn't it there should be some way to like i think i think google or somebody's working on a recall email feature or something but i've done that probably at least at least, well, more than a few times in my professional career, and every single time that I've done that, it felt so good, and then it resulted in a complete disaster. And it's like, no, exactly. Yeah, that's probably a good strategy, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's like, I just, I don't know, every time I just assume the brilliance of my writing is just going to <laughs> overwhelm the recipient. It's, ah, you're right, it's just, I just now see the, the truth. And so, what was I thinking? But it, it never turns out that way for some reason. But um, So, yeah, selfishness can make us foolish, right? So, so, like, I've got to protect my image here, or I've got to... Uh, set the record straight. Um, uh, it can also lead to other sins, as we looked at the passage in Second Timothy. All these other things can flow out of that. Uh, and then it ultimately leads to death, doesn't it? Hell is full of selfish people. You ever think about that? It's like, help, basically God says, I'm going to give you your wish and let you get what you want. Which is, I want to be by myself, or I want everything to be focused on me. So what is the antidote for selfishness? I think there's a, a few things we could look at scripturally. One is that we need to focus on our identity in Christ. If, if, we, if we're focusing on Christ, it kind of sets our perspective of ourself in a proper context. And when we talk about our identity in Christ, there's two aspects to this. One is that we are in Christ, and then the secondly, Christ is in us, Scripture tells us. Some of those are sort of mysterious concepts. Uh, but when we think about that we're in Christ, really there's a couple ways that we're in Christ. One is we are in him, in his body. So when Christ died on the cross, we're in Christ, Paul talks about in Romans uh, and that our sin was placed upon him. And so when he died, he paid the penalty for our sin because we're in Christ. And then when we resurrected, uh, again in Romans, Paul talks about the fact 
that we're also resurrected with him. Uh, and so that our sanctification, when God looks upon us and calls us justified, is because we are in Christ. He sees Christ as opposed to us. So that, that identity provides both a spiritual benefit, both for our justification and for our positional sanctification, but it also provides a context for the fact that we're also in Christ from the perspective that we're in his body, we're in the body of Christ. And I think, uh, I think as Christians, we really don't fully meditate on the, the significance of both of those components, right? So the fact that I am in, another, I am in Christ through the body, my relationship with each of you, gives me a, another unique way to experience Christ in a, a, another reality through each of you so Christ can speak to me through what he speaks and you share with me, it also gives me an opportunity in each of us to minister to each other. We become literally the arms and legs of Christ in the world and also in a more intimate setting in the, in the body of believers. Uh, and so if, we, if we're meditating and thinking about that constantly, I think that helps to put our selfishness into a, a different perspective uh, that we can learn how to focus on that identity and so that we don't have to worry about defending who we are because our identity is no longer about us. Our identity is tr tied into Christ, both in the context uh, uh, of our justification and also in the context of our relationship uh, in, the, in the body. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's okay, Laura. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, Laura. <laughs> I like your dial tone, though. <laughs> okay. It used to be, yeah, it used to be that overjoy. Oh, that's but good. It changed on me. I don't like it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. okay. I'm, I'm that's okay, Laura. All right. So our identity is in Christ, and then also the fact that Christ is in us. Uh, again, this can be... Uh, I think a help relative to our selfishness. If we meditate on the fact that Christ is in us, and then I start to be selfish, what am I doing? You're not representing Christ. You're dragging Christ into your selfish acts. Okay? I, I think that's, that's useful when you're dealing with the temptation also, the fact that we, we tend to think God is somewhere far away, so that when we sin, we're kind of doing it on the backside of the desert, right? Uh, we obviously know <clears throat> cognitively that God is omniscient, so he, he sees everything, he's omnipresent. But literally, in a more intimate perspective, Scripture tells us that Christ literally is in us. And so as I'm walking around the day, He's literally with me every step. We need to, we need to keep meditating uh, and going back to some of the things I said in the first lesson about using a sanctified imagination to, to actually imagine that reality. Now, we, we normally think the word of imagination is about thinking about things that aren't real. Here I'm using imagination as a way to visualize something that's literally real. Uh, a good friend of mine, David Hatcher, who some of y'all have may have heard. I, I know he's been at the church before. He's a missionary to Manaus. I uh, wrote a book called Oneness with God, and in that he has some very practical exercises about making that more reality. So, for example, he says the next time you go to a vending machine, since Christ is in you, ask Christ right there, what do you think we should be eating? Okay, that sounds a little weird, but it's really literally true, isn't it? If our bodies are the temple of of God and Christ is in us, then what we're eating, uh, don't you think he should have uh, a part of that discussion? And that could be extended to anything we do, right? He really likes chocolate. He really likes chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good to hear that. <laughs> okay. So another thing we can do is focus on the example of Christ. So we focus on our identity as we start to reflect on identity. Who is this person that's living in us? Uh, we, we see a, a, an amazing description of that 
in Philippians uh, chapter 2, where Paul talks about what Christ did, his selflessness, uh, and how uh, he was focused on us in doing that. Uh, when you think about the Bible, flipping over from selfish examples, what are some examples of selfless people? Can you think of some examples of that? The father of the prodigal son. Okay. Yes, Lee? Missionaries? Okay. What about, what about, yes, go ahead. Oh, that's a good example. Okay, ah, that's a really good example. Okay. Yes, Jason. Who else? What about Mary? Mary. That's a great example. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's good to start thinking about some of those examples. I listed a few of those. I forgot Mary and Jonathan. Those were really two good ones. Um, but there's a lot of examples that we can look at of selflessness in the Bible. Um, so a, a, third, a third way as an antidote is, so we, we focus on our identity in Christ. We focus on the, the, the picture of Christ. Uh, we can focus on our purpose in Christ, right? Again, if my purpose in a situation is to always be thinking, how can God's glory be reflected in this? If I'm always operating in that mode, that's going to tend to push my selfishness in second place because anytime I start being selfish I'm really departing from that purpose okay uh, so that's another thing we can be thinking about uh, a fourth one is to focus on our reward in Christ and so there's there's lots of examples in scripture that talk about the fact that people were motivated on the basis of the reward uh, and so here's several of those. Uh, we, we see Moses says he was looking forward to the reward. That's how he was able to say no to selfishness. Uh, we look at uh, the fact that God has prepared all these things for us. And Paul talks about the fact that the, the struggles that we're going through are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And even when you look and think about Christ himself... The writer of the Hebrews tells us that Christ was able to endure his suffering because of what? The joy set before him. Okay. Uh, now, so we can look forward to our reward. Uh, and when we think of a future reward, there, there's really two things. First, we have the reward of Jesus, and then we have the reward from Jesus. There are sort of two rewards. So in Philippians, Paul focuses on this concept of heaven ultimately is a place where our reward, our treasure is Christ. That's our ultimate reward. Uh, but there's also a promise of of a reward from him, okay? Think about the, the parable of the talents. What does Christ say to the, to, the, uh, to the servant that took what God gave him and used it not on himself, like the, the third servant, right? He just kind of kept it for himself and buried it, but he, he used it and gave it away to reflect God's glory. Wow, what, what's... What is the reward that he receives from Christ? What's that? Joy. joy. Okay. And what was the what was the basis of that joy? Okay. Certainly, there's a joy in, in being recognized and getting a responsibility. But ultimately, did anybody remember the 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 um, essay the weight of glory because because lewis talks exactly about this whole con the, the whole concept of being affirmed by god that that is an incredible treasure or joy uh i remember years ago um i'd known uh lee todd prior to him becoming president and he actually taught sunday school at uh, calvary baptist for several years and so when i was in college 
I got to know him. And so subsequently, when I became a faculty member, he became president. And so there was uh, a task that I was asked to, to undertake, and so he wanted to talk about that. And so I had a meeting to go in to see him. He completely, he did not associate my name with, with what had been given. So I walked into his office, and he, just this big smile it came over his face. I didn't know it was you. Uh, and so we literally sat down for 30 minutes and talked nothing about what the meeting was supposed to be. He was just talking about uh, our days at Calvary and uh, just ministry issues and so on. And for me, that was in a very small sense a picture of what, what we're talking about here. It was to go into the, the president's office and to be recognized. Uh, that that in, energized me for at least for a couple of years, just that one meeting, okay? That really motivated me. Be, and so the same thing I think here is just to go into the presence of God for Christ to recognize and acknowledge you, that he knows who you are and what, what you've done. Uh, there's a certain joy that. If you, if you didn't read that essay by Lewis, I highly encourage you to go back and read that because he really talks about uh, the dynamic of that of that type of uh, recognition and so there, there's a quote at the end of that or actually at the beginning of that essay I want to just end with this because when we think about reward what do we tend to think about in the context of what we've been uh, discussing here if I'm seeking a reward what am I What's that? I, I sometimes think that's all I'm seeking, and I'm being selfish. I'm being selfish, right? Do we tend to think of people that, that seek or work for rewards are selfish? We tend to make that connection, right? Uh, and really the whole, the whole point that Lewis makes in that essay, in fact, he actually opens it up that way. Uh, so let me just read this. I think it's, it's fascinating. He says, the New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end to itself. That's an interesting opening sentence. It says, We are told to deny ourselves and take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ in nearly every description of what we truly ultimately find if, if we do so contains an appeal to desire. If there lurks in most modern minds the notion that desire for our own good and earnestly to hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit this notion as crept in from Kant, Immanuel Kant, and the Stoics, and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And then he finishes, We must not be troubled by unbelievers when they say that this promised reward makes the Christian life a mercenary affair. There are different kinds of rewards. There is a reward which has no natural connection with the things you do to earn it, and it is quite forward to the desires that ought to accompany such things. He gives several examples in, in his essay, but this is the one I thought was most poignant. He says, money is not the natural reward of love. That is why we call a man a mercenary if he marries a woman for the sake of her money. But marriage is the proper reward for a real lover, and he is not a mercenary for desiring it. So what is, what is Lewis saying here in the context of our, our Christian faith and the concept of reward? Okay. Is it okay to desire heaven? Does that make us selfish? No, right? If I love Christ, and we have this concept, that, 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 I like that analogy because it really dovetails back into the whole concept of Christ as the bridegroom and us as the bride, right? So it, it is not wrong to be motivated out of a desire to please Christ and to look forward and desire the reward that will accompany that, okay? That doesn't make us selfish. 
does everybody see that, what I'm saying? I think sometimes we fall into that trap, though, okay? So that's, that, that's something to kind of nuance out here. So what would we conclude, then, about the concept of selfishness as a barrier to our joy? Can selfishness be a barrier? And, and sometimes in very subtle ways, I think as Christians, uh, it's like Yancey talked about at the beginning. We're, we, we may have eliminated these gross sins that might get us in the paper, uh, but these sort of subtle sins in our heart that, that are, 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 again, born by this sort of virus of, of selfishness can manifest itself in ways that we think are going to bring us joy, but ultimately they do just the opposite. 